And Charlie, you were one of the moderators of that Harris-Cheney conversation today, one of the two. What did you make of what you heard? And what do you think the voters who were there thought? Well, first of all, um, you know, Kamala Harris came into the the reddest part of red Wisconsin, going to Brookfield, Wisconsin. Matt is really the beating heart of the Republican base, and to be joined by Liz Cheney is um, is pretty remarkable. I mean, I don't want to gloss over that. Um, you know, what you saw today was how serious the the Harris campaign is to reach out to disaffected Republicans, not just moderates, but also conservatives, people who have voted for Republicans their whole lives um, and yet are repulsed by Donald Trump. And so the fact that she took this um, this roadshow from uh, Pennsylvania to Michigan to Wisconsin really, I think, is an illustration of the way in which she has decided that she's going to be playing for this big tent, this this bipartisan coalition and the tone of these discussions and the discussion that I had with her and that she had in Michigan and Pennsylvania could not be more different than what you've heard from Donald Trump over the last uh, several days. Susan, what do you think about how both of these candidates are making their closing arguments? <laughs> I mean, closing arguments is being generous there, Steph. I mean, do you consider talking about Arnold Palmer's genitalia to be a closing argument? Do you? I mean, you know, look, the, the bottom line is that uh, Donald Trump closes, uh, and this is now the third straight campaign, with the kind of overconfidence that he sees as his trademark. And so even if he's not winning, he's going to project that he is winning. He's going to project the kind of bluster that we're seeing. Uh, it, it, it's hard to discern a strategic focus from Trump at this point. Uh, you know, I do think that he sounds like someone who feels quite confident here. And, you know, in some ways that has me very worried. I was already very worried about Trump's willingness to accept anything other than a victory. And I do worry when I hear these statements from him that he's convinced himself so much that it's impossible for Kamala Harris to win, that if he were to be defeated, uh, you know, of course, that would immediately lead to an impossible, it's impossible. Therefore, we must challenge the election. But right now, what I'm seeing is that both campaigns don't really know that it's teetering on the knife's edge, and they're just going to go back and forth and back and forth to the same small handful of states while the rest of us look on here and wonder whether Donald Trump in two weeks is going to be returned to office. Well, they're going after the same handful of states, but the Harris team clearly has this strategy, John, where they believe or they want to shave off enough right-leaning voters for these states to make a difference, Vera, what do you think of the strategy? Is there a risk that she alienates left-leaning ones? I think for the most part, there's not a risk in uh, alienating the left. Uh, most of the people who are anti-Trump are pretty hardcore anti-Trump, uh, particularly when you're talking about the Democrats. I think, um, you know, obviously they've done some research and they feel comfortable with putting Liz Cheney out there. I think if you were to pick a single surrogate uh, that would rile up uh, the left in some way, uh, it would be Liz Cheney, who was obviously such a big part of the uh, Iraq war way back when, not that long ago, I think in all of our memories. Um, but at the same time, Liz, what she's, the argument that Kamala Harris is making, as she said, is uh, the two of them have more in common than they have, uh, you know, where the, than they diverge. And as a result, they're able to stand together against Trump. The smart thing for campaigns to do, if they can get away with it, is both fire up their bases and reach out to the other side at the same time. Most of them aren't good at doing it. That's what I think Kamala Harris is doing right now. Susan, new topic. What is a bigger deal, a more impactful one? Kamala Harris's huge fundraising numbers or the fact that the majority of Donald Trump's money is coming from just four people and they're writing four giant checks and doing more than that. You got Elon Musk out there campaigning every single day. Now he's thrown in a million dollar giveaway. So what matters more? Yeah, Steph, you know, I just spent the last few months uh, reporting about and writing about Trump and his billionaires. And what's so striking, as you said, is that Democrats have an overall money advantage in the presidential race. But Donald Trump is raising huge increments of money, amounts of money that would have been completely unthinkable in our politics, even as recently as just a few years ago. People writing $50 million checks to super PACs. There's Elon Musk, $75 million that he spent, and that's still not probably the full extent of it, on his pro-Trump super PAC. And so these are just vast amounts of money. And I think what you're seeing is the fusion of Donald Trump's transactionalism with 
kind of the breakdown of any kind of legal efforts to regulate the amount of money in politics in the wake of the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision. And so, you know, look at what Trump did in his four years in the White House. He gave major donors extraordinary and largely undisclosed access to the Oval Office, to uh, parts of the federal government, uh, you know, made some of these people his, uh, in effect, personal envoys, whether to departments of the executive branch or even to foreign leaders. And I think that, you know, that's the risk of a second Trump presidency is that he's even more dependent on the Elon Musks and the Miriam Adelsons and the Timothy Mellons than he would have been in his first term. And, uh, you know, he's a very transactional guy and these billionaires are very transactional. They don't just want, as one uh, person put it to me, a seat at the state dinner anymore. They want someone in the Oval Office to take their phone calls and to deal with their issues. Charlie, what do you think of that, right? Checks for 50 million, 75 million, $100 million. These aren't your traditional conservative donors, and some, not these no. four, but some left Trump after his first term, certainly left Trump after January right. 6th, and they're quietly making their way back. What do you think of that? Well, as Susan knows, I'm somewhat uh, obsessed with her reporting because I think this is a huge story. Um, the, there's the rise of the incredibly ambitious oligarchs out there, and this is going to, I, th I think, uh, survive even Trumpism. That you know, we talk a lot about authoritarianism, which I think is a genuine and immediate cr uh, problem and, and, and a threat. This larger problem of the transactional oligarchs, which we've seen in other countries, I think is upon us right now. When when you see exactly what uh, Susan describes in this article, this uh, complete transaction, uh, we, we, we talk about grift, we talk about corruption, but now we're talking about it at industrial scale. And that would certainly be a marker of Trump 2.0, um, and the, the, the arrogance and the aggressiveness of it cannot be underestimated here. I want to talk about this specific thing that Elon Musk is doing, though, John. The world's richest man offering registered voters a million dollars to basically win the possibility of getting this money if they sign a petition. Is this even legal? <laughs> Some legal experts think that it's not. Others think that it is. Obviously, hasn't been tested in court yet. Um, what I would say is that uh, nobody has proved a causal relationship between wealth and campaign finance ethics. Um, and many people would suggest that there is a, a reverse causation there. I, the person who's got to be angriest about this, though, Steph, is Donald Trump, who, as you point out, is trailing Kamala Harris in fundraising and has you know, begged Musk to put more money into super PACs to help him. Uh, Musk, of course, openly campaigning for a job that he has named as, I guess, the head of... Uh, of government efficiency or whatever as he gives millions and millions of dollars away in campaigns for Donald Trump, uh, getting to the problem that Charlie and Susan were, were talking about. I'd bet a lot of money, certainly not a million dollars, that Elon Musk will not take any official role if Donald Trump is an ex-president. He won't need to. He'll get everything he wants from behind the scenes. Charlie, Donald Trump has been trying to cast doubt on the election. You all know that. Yet in North Carolina today, he said he has not seen any cheating with two weeks ago. What do you make of that? Completely irrelevant, because, in, in fact, Donald Trump is not going to accept the results of this election. No one who has followed Donald Trump believes that he will graciously concede or acknowledge defeat in this, this election. Um, he has uh, created an infrastructure and created, obviously, uh, a mood among his base that no result is going to be um, re respected. And I think that we need to brace ourselves for this. That uh, that after 2020, of course, we had tremendous chaos, but 2024 in many ways is worse because there's no indication that the Republican Party will push back or resist him in any way. Uh, the Republican base has been primed for four years to believe lies and to conspiracy theories. And again, no, as we're seeing with the hurricane, there is no lie that is too outrageous or implausible that he will not that he will not spread and that his base will believe, and anyone expects that the Republican establishment will push back on him as they did four years ago, I think has not been paying attention. So all the, all the flares should be going up. Susan, VP Harris has this new strategy of playing clips of Donald Trump's comments at her rallies because she wants to make sure voters see him and hear him 
in his own words. We know that his shocking comment, comments have been dominating the headlines since he stepped onto the political scene. What is her new goal here in showing this? Yeah, look, you asked me earlier about her closing argument. This is her closing argument. Donald Trump is too dangerous to be president again. Donald Trump is unfit for office. It's not that complicated. And as always, Donald Trump is the best campaigner that there could be for Democrats. He has united Democrats largely for the last nine years since he stepped on the political stage. And if Harris is going to win this very tight election, it's going to be because she convinces people that it's a referendum on Donald Trump and not a referendum on her and the Biden administration's record of the last four years. So Donald Trump is, in a nutshell, her closing argument. And just quickly to Charlie's point about uh, Trump and how he's prepared the stage for rejecting this election. In North Carolina, the person who's standing next to him was the congressman who publicly, a Republican congressman who refuted Trump's own lies about the FEMA aid for hurricane victims in his own district. And yet there he is standing beside Donald Trump endorsing him in the same way that Ohio Governor Mike DeWine refuted Trump's lies about eating the dogs in Springfield, Ohio, and yet is still endorsing him and publicly voting for him.